All right, so good morning um, once again, and then you're welcome to today's class. For today's class, um, the topic that we will be considering is the um, lecture topic, classical macroeconomics, classical macroeconomics and the Keynesian general equilibrium of the AS and the AD model. That's what we are considering today. And this topic um, might take us for the next maybe three weeks because it is um, a topic that is loaded. It is broad in its own perspective. And this is the um, backbone of macroeconomics. So when you're talking about macroeconomics, all you've learned from your year one, year two, and now year three, all of them should be aggregated to this particular topic. So this is, you know, majorly like the backbone of um, uh, macroeconomics, okay? So um, we will dwell so much on the introduction of this particular topic and your understanding of this introduction will help you to analyze other issues that are related to this particular topic. So as an introduction, of course, you know that macroeconomics tries to explain the activities or those particular variables or those particular economic phenomena that affect the entire economy as a whole. So when you're talking about macroeconomics as an introduction, of course, you know by now that you are looking at economic decisions. You are trying to make efficient economic decisions that will definitely, okay, affect the entire agents of the economy. Again, you would also realize or agree with me that when you're talking about macroeconomics all right and you look at another aspect the macroeconomic agents in the economy you must understand the agents that thrive in the economy again you also know that those agents are the consumers the producers as well as the government so these three particular agents of the economy, all right, are actively involved in decision making. Okay, so you have also been exposed to who the consumers are, and that is why you look at the consumption hypothesis and all of that, the Keynesian absolute income hypothesis, the relative, the permanent, the life cycle, all right the random work hypothesis. All of that are related to the consumer, the consumption side. Then you have also been introduced to the investment, the investor, all right? The investor, and you've looked at the various theories of investment. You have discussed that in previous sessions. And that is why you know, we consider the accelerator theory, the Keynesian theory of investment, we look at the Tobin's key theory of investment. We look at, um, there are so many theories of investment, maybe about six, seven of them. So you have been exposed to that. And now again, we have the government, all right? And then when we consider the government, we now look at the activities of the government with respect to their revenue and with respect to their expenditure pattern. But you see that one thing you have to understand is that the government plays an intermediating role, okay, for the consumer and the investor. So that is why when you want to treat the government, you don't just treat the government just like the way you treat the consumption hypothesis or consumption side, or the way you treat the investment or the investor side. You treat the government, all right, with that understanding that government plays an intermediating role in the economy. And that is why you begin to look at policies that are relevant to the government. So the 
utmost objective of this particular topic is to get to that government side where we look at policies that are relevant to the work to the government. So now these are the various agents that are in the economy, the consumer, the investor, and the government. Again, you know, when we talk about an economy, we are looking at a particular economic territory. We are looking at a particular terrain where we can have a uniform monetary, fiscal, as well as exchange rate policies operating. That is an economy, okay? So Nigeria is an economy. The political scientists, they will tell you, oh, Nigeria is a state because the political scientists are looking at the jurisdiction in which authority actually does what take place, okay? So that is that. But when you look at the um, economy with respect or the state of Nigeria with respect to the economy, when you look at that, you will discover that for the economy as Nigeria, we consider those particular economic activities that are predominant within the geographical terrain, within the terrain where one policy, all right, one currency, okay, one government decisions will affect the entire agent. Okay. So that is just a bit or an introduction to that part, this particular macroeconomic, because most of the topics will be treating from now. They cannot be treated in isolation of the whole economy as a whole. Consumption hypothesis can be treated in isolation of the other agents of the economy. Investment can be treated in isolation with the other agents in the economy. However, however, um, this particular topic cannot be treated in, in, in an isolation with other, um, other aspects of the economy. So that is why I'm giving you a general overview of macroeconomics, I'm giving you a general, a general overview of the various agents that are predominant in the economy. The next general overview I'm going to give you are the various types of markets. This is very important. That's the next general overview I am going to give you. The various types of the market, okay? Now, in macroeconomics, we consider that there are four major types of markets. The first one is the commodity market. The second one is the money market. The third one is the labor market. And the fourth one is the bond market. Okay, so in your year one, you have just been introduced generally to macroeconomics. In your year two, you were introduced, all right, to the commodity market and the money market. Now in year three, we will try to reintroduce the commodity market, the money market, and the labor market. We'll bring these three together and we'll begin to interact with them. In your year four, you will then be exposed to the bond market. And then you begin to tie up the four types of markets and begin to understand the activities that goes on in those four types of market. However, the beauty of this is that if you have an understanding of three types of market you have, the commodity, the money market, and the labor market, if you have a perfect understanding of these three types of market, you wouldn't have a major challenge trying to hard or deal with the fourth type of market, which is the bond market when you get to your year four, simply because these three types of market, they can coexist, okay, on their own. They are, let me say, self-regulatory and self-sufficient. You know, when we say something is sufficient, what we are trying to say is that 
that particular thing, okay, can depend, okay, does not need to depend on something else, okay, or even if that particular thing depends on something else, it will always be provided. It will always be readily available, even if that particular thing depends on something else. So you don't really need to worry so much when you get to your year four. You know, sometimes that is why they say, oh, year three is the toughest or is the most difficult because year three tries to tie year one and year two and then your year three of what you are going to have a balanced approach or a balanced overview of your study. So year four is just kind of adding to it or topping up on it, even at your master's level, just like an addition. So in year three now, we consider just three types of that market, which is the commodity market, the money market, and then the labor market. Thankfully, I have discussed the labor market with you last week. But what you need to take out from that labor market is this. One, you need to understand that in that labor market, there is always an interaction between your demand for labor and the supply of your labor. Two, you must also understand that a major determinant that we need to consider in that labor market is your wage rate and the level of what capital employed okay again the major things you need to consider in that labor market is your wage rate the level of capital employed an auxiliary consideration you can then have is your level of employment employment rate so anytime somebody tells you or talks to you about the labor market, what you should have in your mind or what you should take in your mind is that, oh, this particular market, three things are very paramount or two are very paramount. The other one will come up as a reason of the other. What are those two things? Wage rate determination, wage, equilibrium wage. The second one is the level of technology that is employed. The auxiliary one becomes your employment rate or your level of employment, okay? That is the labor market, okay? Another thing you must also understand in the labor market is that in the labor market, output is determined. Output is determined. That is where production actually takes place, the labor market. That is where production actually takes place. That is where output is produced. That is the real sector. So when you hear somebody talking to you or speaking on the news, on the media, and explaining, oh, the real sector, if they need to invest in the real sector, if they need to do this in the real sector, blah, 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 blah. That person is actually referring to the labor market. To the industrialists, they look at it as a real sector. To the, to the, to the industry, all right, they consider it as a real sector. But when you go to academics, we consider it as a labor market. So that real sector, or rather the labor market, is main focus. The major aim is production, production of output. And that is why you consider when I first mentioned the labor market, I told you that two things are very paramount real wage rate, the wage rate, and the level of technology. And of course, wage will go with employment. You are employed as a factor input that is needed for what? For production. Your capital will generally be employed for what? For production. The normal um, pedestrian nomenclature of what we call capital is just what? Um, items you buy, not for immediate consumption, but for further work, production. So whenever you hear that capital, you hear wage. Wage is used to pay for labor. Labor is not employed to be eaten, no. For labor is employed, so now we can engage the work, the physical and the human effort of human beings towards work, production. So that tells you that the real sector 
is concentrating attention on production. Okay, so if the real sector concentrates or is dwelling on production, that also tells you again that the real sector under that particular scenario, price, prices of final goods and services is the major concern in that real sector. Because once they produce, there must be a price tag on the output they produce. So when they produce, there's a price tag on that output that has been produced. Definitely, all right, the price of the goods and services becomes a concern there. Okay, now let's go to the commodity market. When you look at the commodity market, the commodity market is the demand side, all right? The commodity market tells you, oh, these are the goods and services that we, both consumer, investor, and the government demand. That is their general demand, okay? And that is why in the commodity side, we consider our demand. What we are interested in is what is the aggregate demand of the economy? What is the aggregate demand of output of the economy? That is our concern, okay? What is the aggregate demand of output within the economy? And so you begin to ask yourself, what are those types of demand that we place? Remember, we have three agents in the economy. The consumer will place a demand on what? On consumption, okay? The investment investor will place a demand on what? Investment. The government places a demand on what? On government expenditure, okay? And we remember that in the economy, okay, we basically have two types of economy, a closed economy, and an open economy. And please, when somebody tells you, give me an example of a closed economy in the world. I don't know if they have answered this in this particular class or maybe it's another class, but we don't have any closed economy in the world. There is no country that does not trade with another country. There is none. No matter how strict they have, you can mention, oh, North Korea, the capital Pyongyang, and you can say North Korea, they are a closed economy and they do not trade with the other counterparts. No, yes, they are very restrictive. Yet, they trade. They trade with Russia. They acquire weapons and ammunition from Russia. They still have other allies. So no matter how you can think about it, even if that country is a war torn country, you talk about Syria, you talk about Libya, you talk about Yemen, you talk about Haiti, or they are being battered with environmental um, disaster, they still trade with what other economies. So there is no closed economy. In fact, every economy, okay, Nigerian economy, South African economy, or German economy, Gambian economy, they are all open economies. The only closed economy is the world economy, world, i.e. the world, all right? This earth we are in, that is the only closed economy. As that today, we are not started trading with another planet, okay? As of today, we only have the earth that is habitable, that we are living. And so all our economic activities are embroiled in this particular earth. So the earth, the world economy becomes our world, our closed economy. So you look at your world output, it's still our closed economy. Of course, in recent developments, you can see the richest people in the world or the most business-minded experts, okay? Jeff Bezos, right? Recently went to space, $5.5 billion just to spend a few minutes there. Mind you, he didn't go there just because um, you can see um, tourist visitation. You, you might call it that way, 
But for him to have spent about $5.5 billion to travel, there must be an interest or a business interest that he has, okay? So this tells you that we are having people beginning to consider trading with other planets, okay? Trading with other planets. They are beginning to consider, can we have another habitable place, all right? Not until then, when, okay, they say in mass now, water is there, there is rock, there is soil. So, mass is closely an habitable um, 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 planet. By the time people begin to say, oh, the earth has been filled with so many um, um, environmental threats, and they decide to move there, and then there is a trade between the earth and the mass, people living there. So, as I then, we can now say, oh, there is no closed economy. So you must understand that. So back to my analysis, when I was talking about the commodity market, and I said the consumer, okay, consumption, the investor, investments, the government, government expenditure. And so our economies are also open to other world's economies. We all will trade with them. And that's when we talk about our export and our what import so export and import so your y equals to c plus i plus g plus x minus m at preliminary in your year one you see that is an expenditure method of computing your national income at this particular stage we'll say that is an equation that is used to determine your aggregate demand is a component of your aggregate demand all right now, remember, we all demand for goods and services. And when we demand for goods and services, we must consider the ability to pay or our medium of exchange. And our medium of exchange is what? Is money. So we consider money as our medium of what? Of exchange. And once we consider money as a medium of exchange, there must be the demand for money. That talks about the money market, that second market. So we have a commodity market where we all desire effectively, you know, we desire effectively that these are the quantities of goods and services that I demand, that I want to consume, that I want to invest, that I want to buy as a government, that I want to export, that I want to import. I have that. I must consider the provision of liquidity that is needed to pay for that particular word, demand are placed. And so, as I'm considering my commodity market, I will also consider my money market, where the money demanded and the money supplied are interacted. So, you see, the commodity market considers my demand for output. The money market considers my demand for money. Both of them we are demanding for different things. And when we combine the two, that gives me my aggregate demand side. Okay? Again, the equation that explains the commodity market is your IS equation. While the equation that explains your money market is your LM equation okay and then when you bring the two together that's why you have your ISLM model i believe you have also been exposed to the ISLM model that is why the course outline is a synchronization of your topic one two three four you know five six they are all following each other okay so if that is the case let's now look at the commodity market, where we consider the demand side, okay, which is the IS. And then we look at the money market, where we consider the money market side, which is LM. We bring the two together so that we will be able to derive our aggregate demand model, all right? So we can begin to um, try and do this using our whiteboard um, marker. So, 
how we proceed with our analysis. Remember, I said the aggregate demand, okay, is an aspect of the economy. And then we then have the aggregate supply, which is the supply side labor market. That is not my interest, but I'm concerned the aggregate demand. Within the aggregate demand, there are two markets I must consider. One, the commodity market, okay? And two, the money market. These are the two markets that are forming the aggregate demand simply because in the commodity market, I demand for what? For output. And then in the money market, I demand for what? For interest rates, for money, okay? Now, if you look at these two markets, in the commodity market, my basic aim is to know my demand for output, why? In the money market, my basic aim is to know the interest rate that is prevailing within the economy. All right, so I have my aggregate demand decomposed to the commodity market and decomposed to the money market. In the commodity market, I want to understand my demand for output. In the money market, I want to understand my demand for money so that I can understand my interest rates. All right? So now, what will I do next? Let me consider, okay, my commodity market. In my commodity market, I start with that my model of Y, all right, is equals to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. You remember, this is my general aggregate demand side, okay? You remember that I only use the simplest expression of consumption. Of course, consumption should be dependent on my disposable income. That should be my consumption dependent on my disposable what income, all right? So if that is my consumption, which is dependent on my disposable income, okay? I wouldn't want to go towards that disposable income where I begin to consider lump sum tax and the tax rate, okay? I'm not considering that. I'm only considering my disposable income with respect, okay, to the normal income. So I can say C is equals to A plus B Y, okay? Just autonomous consumption plus my marginal propensity to consume plus my income. I don't want to consider the disposable income. I'm not going to advance. We've done that in your topic one. Again, I would define my investment. And my investment will be equal to what? My autonomous investment plus, or my, I'm sorry, minus my reduced, induced investment. Of course, you know that the autonomous investment is your IO. And that tells you your level of um, investor's confidence, which is your level of investment that is not dependent on interest rates. And whenever that level of investment is increasing, that tells you that investors are beginning to trust the economic system. And then we have the other counterpart, which is your induced form of investment. Of course, your government expenditure is always exogenous, meaning your government expenditure is not dependent on the economy, on the situations of demand. Government expenditure is dependent strictly on your budget. At the beginning of the year, you draw up your budget. This is my proposed expenditure. This is my proposed income. And the budget you have drawn up 
is not dependent on how the economy looks like. What will be the output of the economy is not dependent. So that is commercial explanation. Again, export also is exogenous. All right. Why do we say we say export is what is exogenous? Simply because export is not dependent on factors within. My export is dependent on foreign income and exchange rates. The exchange rate is exogenous, is volatile. Exchange rate is not dependent on me. The foreign income abroad or income of advanced economies, I don't have control over it. So my export is exogenous. However, my import is endogenous. And so my import is equal to my autonomous import plus my marginal propensity to import one, MY, M1Y. You'll see that this autonomous import is not dependent on the level of domestic income, but the induced import is dependent on the level of domestic income. Why? Simply because as your income increases, the more you have the flair to import, that is it. As my income increases, probably to Obikubana, I wouldn't be putting on a native, a local Nigerian t-shirt anymore. I will be thinking of designer's t-shirt. I will be motivated to go and cool off in Dubai after an activity. Maybe after this lecture or once the exam is through, I decide to travel to Dubai to go and cool off. That the stress is too much. Oh, you know that stress is much. Simply because my income is rising. So my import will be dependent on my level of income. I know you have done this in your topic one or two. Why I am stressing or making emphasis on this is so that when you get to policy implication, when I begin to tell you stories around investors trying to gain trust on the economy, on the system, what will be the impact on aggregate demand, aggregate supply, you must or you need to trace it back to this particular model. When I begin to tell you, oh, someone just got richer having some business prospects and the rest, what will happen to the aggregate demand? You should be able to tell me and trace it back to the induced component of import. That is why I'm laying emphasis on this particular model, okay? So I have been able to define every of the variables we have here. What will I do next? I will solve all of them together and substitute, okay? So if I solve all of them together, and substitute, then I will have this, my Y, okay? Um, my Y, sorry, please. So my Y is supposed to C, remember, is A plus B Y, okay? Plus I is what? I1 minus IO, sorry. IO, all right. IO minus I1R, okay? My G, all right, is autonomous. That is plus GO, okay? My X is also autonomous, which is XO. Then I have my N which is defined by minus M1, okay, minus, oh, minus MO, sorry, from the last um, note, minus MO, minus M1Y, okay? So I will solve taking all Y to one side, of course. You know that Y minus BY, your plus BY goes to the other side, because minus BY, minus M1Y, goes to that side becomes what plus m1 y okay is equals to now i don't want to keep writing a um i o okay okay let me just write it for the first time it's now equals to a plus what i o okay um plus g o okay plus x o 
okay minus m o all right uh, then minus i one r minus i one r okay now, why I put all of those ones in brackets, A plus I, O plus G, O plus X, O minus M, O, they are all exogenous. They will always be an alphabet, um, a number, 15, 20, 32, 40, they will always be 30, so they are exogenous. So I can say, let all of those exogenous variables, let me call them A, let all of them be A for simplicity, okay? So if I call all of those exogenous variables A, then I can factor out my common term from the left-hand side, which is Y. Y into Y is 1, minus Y into B, Y, B. All right? Oh, sorry. I still have my M. Then plus what? M1, okay? Should be equals to A, okay? Minus I1, R. So, what will I do next? I would then divide both sides by what? I would divide both sides by one minus B plus M1. So if I do that, that means my Y, okay, is equals to A over one minus B plus M1, all right? Minus I1 over one minus b plus m1 okay ow this okay is my is equation is equation okay that i got from my commodity market i'm true with commodity market remember that that a are exogenous variables and those A are policy variables. So whenever we introduce some policies on the demand side, you need to understand that these policies on the demand side are going straight to affect your ADS, and we'll begin to talk about it later. Having said that, I will consider my LM, which is my, my money market and derive the equation there, which is my LM equation, okay? And if I'm to do that, all right, what will I do? I create a new, um, okay? In my LM, two things are important, the money demand and the money supply. My money supply, okay, from the money market is exogenous, again, that money supply is determined by the monetary authority. They decide to increase or reduce the volume of money circulation, and it is never dependent on any activity. However, our money demand, okay, we follow the Keynesian assumption on the demand for money, which is said money is demanded for transactionary and speculative as well as precautionary. But remember that precautionary and transactionary are dependent on the level of um, income. So I can say MB equals to MO, which is the autonomous part, plus M1, Y, which is dependent on Y, minus M2, R. Oh, okay. Um, sorry minus m to r okay so my money demand is on this side m o plus m one y minus m to r my money supply is on this left side at equilibrium in the money market i equate my what my my money supply plus money demand when i do that i have my m s to be equals to what m o plus m1y minus m2r okay remember i said in the money market the interest rate is determined in the money market all right in the money market the interest rate is what is determined in the commodity market look at this in this commodity market what happens my output is determined in the commodity market 
my output is what is determined. Look at it. In the commodity market, you see that I said Y is a function of R. That's the commodity market. Okay. But in the in this commodity market, Y is a function of R. Meaning R is independent variable, is ex, is, a, um, is is independent, is the explanatory variable. So what that means is that this R, okay, is my independent variable. The R is not determined within this commodity market. The R is not what determined within this world, commodity world, commodity market, okay? So if the hour is not determined within the commodity market, that means I need to determine hour in the money market. And if I'm to determine hour in the money market, what happens? I go to my money market. In my money supply cost money demand, I will make hour subject of the formula because I want to determine how. I want to determine the interest rate. Linking the two together, okay? What will I have? I will then have M2R, all right, is equals to what? MO plus M1Y minus MS. Okay, I will make R sorry for the formula so that my R should be equals to what? MO and MS. They are both exogenous. If you look at that model. MO and MS, they are like the intercept, so they're exogenous. I will take them together. MO, all right, minus MS, okay, over M2, okay, plus M1, all right, M1, okay, Y over M2. So I can say let m o minus m s bar i can say let that be my exogenous let it be b i can call it b or let me call it um d let me call it d because i don't have d here so if i say um i call it d what happens so i have um my LM equation to be what? R is equals to D over what? The um, coefficient over M2, all right? Plus M1 over M2Y. This is my LM what equation. This is my LM equation, okay? So now, we have been able to get our commodity market and our money market. That is what we are able to get. Okay. So I will pause to take a um, question. I saw someone's hand um, raised. Yes, Lawson, please, you can um, speak. Good morning, sir. Yes, good morning. Sir, I didn't get uh, the statement on M, on D. What is D? Look on D, okay, I will explain. Is that the only question? Yes, sir, that's the only question. All right, so you can move, I will explain. Bello Mary, so what's your question also? Mary, you can speak, please. Yes, sir. Yes, can speak. The money market. Okay. Is it? The interaction between the uh, money demand and money supply, is it that the money demand is equal to money supply? Because on the equation, you said MS is equal to the equation of money demand. That's the MO plus MY, M1Y minus M2R. Okay, uh, you mean here, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so you can, you can mute your mic. I would um, explain now. Okay. Okay, sir. So um, in the money market, the interaction is in the money market, the interaction, okay, is money supply is supposed to money demand. That's the beginning at equilibrium. That interaction, money supply will always be equal to what money demand. That's interaction, okay? 
However, money supply is exogenous. That's why it is here. Money supply, exogenous. Money demand is not exogenous, it's endogenous. Money demand is gotten from our Keynesian demand for money, all right? Which is the um, demand for speculative or transactionary and for precautionary. However, precautionary and transactionary are dependent on the level of income. So I can bring the two together. Of course, transactionary, I must be able to bridge my gap between when income is end and another time income is received first. Before, I will now consider having some money for, for, my, for, my, for my transactionary, for my precautionary in case of unforeseen contingency. So two of them are what are linked together. So I call them one. That is this M1Y. Then I have my M0, which is also um, um, endogenous, okay? Exogenous, sorry, autonomous. And then M2R. So at equilibrium, money supply will be equal to money demand. So if at equilibrium, money supply equals money demand, that's why I have this next equation that I have here. And then I begin to solve, okay? Then for lossing, when I got to R equals to MO minus MS over M2 plus M1 over M2Y, I said MO minus MS, they are exogenous. Is exogenous, exo, is exogenous, okay? And I just say, okay, since it is exogenous, let me call them one. I can also decide not to call them what? One, all right? I might decide to separate them, okay? And so if I separate them, what will I have? Let me decide to separate them for clarity again. If I separate them, I will have R is equals to MO over M2 minus MS bar over M2. So I believe this makes it clearer. Yes, I understand. Okay, yeah, so this makes it clearer. Someone in the chat I also saw um, was asking a question around what about the investment that is induced due to income? Yes, you can also have an investment that is induced, which is due to income, all right? In this um, particular scenario, in the definition, you can extend this definition. However, I'm not, I'm not studying ISLM, and I'm not studying the aggregate demand. That is why I made this equation simpler. I'm just trying to compress it, just to take the basic policy variables, that's all. When you go to your, in your previous classes, that I would have been expanded. C will be expanded, okay? All right, but in this level, I am just considering my policy variable, and that is why I limited my explanation, all right? Um, let me check again if I have other, um, questions. Okay, um, I should explain the um, concept of autonomous investment. Autonomous investment is that investment, all right, that is not dependent on level of interest rates, nor income. You remember that if you consider your several theories of investment, they hinged on investment is dependent on either current income or previous income, current output or previous output or interest rates. But autonomous investment is not dependent on that. Autonomous investment is an investment that is because of an improvement in investment climate. That's autonomous investment. Whenever there's an improvement in investment climate, we call that autonomous investment. That's the investment that is not because of anything. Just because those investors feel they are gaining more trust and confidence within the system and they decide to invest. That's autonomous. So if, for example, I just decide or I make up my mind to, to start fish business or pond, poultry, okay? Maybe in somewhere at Abulegba, 
or some go. And it's not because I got interest rate reduced and I was able to borrow money. It's not because my salary increased. It's just because I just woke up and I said, ah. Somebody just told me, come and invest, you. come and start doing poultry business. You. And that song goes side. Ah, it's safe, oh. there is land. Land is cheap there, oh. it's safe. People will not vandalize your, 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 your properties and the rest. So what happens? The next thing is what? You just decide to take up that particular decision. That's autonomous investment. So I proceed and I continue to where I'm going to. So this is my my um lm okay and then recall that my is is uh, this this is my is so i can link um this particular one all right i can link this let's recall this formula a over one minus b plus m1 i can link it together here so why um why is equals to a over one minus b plus m1 all right minus i one r over one minus b plus m1 okay let me recall if that is correct let me recall if that is correct okay i'm correct so this is my lm this is my is okay now when i solve the two together now in the is demand my demand is determined but the interest rate that will determine the level of money i need is not known so what do i do i go to lm in the lm it has been able to show me how my interest rate is determined. I will substitute my LM, that interest rate, out into my IS to solve and find Y. The Y there becomes my aggregate demand equation. So that tells you that the combination of your IS and your LM will give you your aggregate demand equation. Okay? So, I will do a little bit of mathematics here now. Um, the screen, I wish the screen, um, um, okay, we'll try and walk around the screen um, so that it will be, um, so um, I'll try and walk around the screen. Um, I, I really don't have a um, touch pad on my phone that would have been a good one but let's walk around it so let's take note i'm going to substitute my r into what my y okay so that i would have y i would have y okay to be equals to a all right over one minus what b okay plus m1 okay all right minus i1 over 1 minus b plus m1 times r okay so let me recall if that is the investment equation is equation correct that's my is equation am i correct yes that's my is equation and then i pick my r which is my lm equation m o m s and um okay so times r is what m o over m2 okay minus m s okay over m2 all right and then i have um plus m1 over what m2 
y okay okay now um all right this is um y sorry that um uh, it can't i wish it can get better like this all right okay so if that is it now remember that all of this is multiplying the numerator i1 this denominator is in all of them take note of that all right <laughs> all right so if i do that all i need is just to bring out this y so that i can take the y to the other side that's what my that's my major aim okay so if that is the case i can now have y to be equals to i still have all of this i'm not rewriting it okay because of space this times this this times this this times this i still have them i'm not going to rewrite it first but I want to bring out this times this, okay? That's my concern, so that I can extract y out. So if I do that, y will be equals to all of those things that I've identified, which I'm not interested in for now, minus i1, m1y over m2, all over one minus b plus m1 okay okay that is it that is all of this oh sorry i1 okay um what you have here is minus that is all of this. This is over. All of this times this. That's what I'm doing. I'm still, I'm, I've still ignored the other parts. I will come back to it. Now, this is this over this over this. Remember, when you convert, all right, it becomes this over this times one over this. So I can just simply delete this one. And it's the same thing as what? Over over m2 times 1 minus b plus m1. Please don't worry. In your closet, you can try it. You will get it. Then I will move all of this to this side, okay? So that y will now be equals to, so it becomes y, it becomes y plus this is equals to all of the other things on the right hand side okay if i factor out what is common here is y if i bring out y then i will have y all right into y into one plus all of this okay just be following you can try it in your closest. It's a simple mass. Then I'll divide all both sides by this particular coefficient so that my AD equation, all right, AD equation becomes Y, all right, is equals to, sorry that I will be shuffling back and front, a over 1 minus b plus m1 a a over 1 minus b plus m1 all right and then um i have minus i1 mo minus i1 mo minus I1, okay, MO over 1 minus, oh, sorry, over M2, 1 minus B plus, oh, 
finding it sorry finding it a bit difficult to do this okay let me just get it now over m2 okay m2 one minus b plus m1 okay then i also have um minus ms now this time around ms bar okay so ms bar minus i1 ms bar over m2 1 minus b plus m1 okay all over that particular coefficient which is one plus i one plus um one plus i1 sorry one plus i1 m1 yeah okay all over one plus i1 okay m1 am i correct let me check one over i1 m1 okay so this is now m2 all over m2 one minus b plus m1 okay so this is your aggregate demand equation aggregate demand equation this is your aggregate demand equation so that tells you that your aggregate demand equation is a combination of your commodity market as well as your money market both of them a combination of the two will give you the aggregate demand equation you can now see that the slope okay you can now see that the aggregate demand equation is dependent on your autonomous components of your aggregate of your commodity market the autonomous components of your money market as well as the induced components of commodity market and money market okay commodity market and money market all right this is your aggregate demand equation when i stop sharing this slide now i will then show you the graph of your aggregate demand equation that means we have successfully understand macroeconomics successfully understand the types of markets we have successfully understand the relevant markets that makes up the aggregate demand, successively understand the equations of the IS and the LM, successively understand the I aggregate demand equation, okay? So let me see if we have um, questions, okay? Please add me, I would like you to, um, use your name if you want to ask some um, um, question so please admin your question you raised your hand admin please yes sir yes good morning yes sir when you were um multiplying sir in that uh i part i i i one part you said that the i one will multiply m one over m two times y okay Yes, sir. So if it is multiplying only that one, sir, the one minus B plus M one that is under it, will you multiply the M two directly or it will go up? Okay, you are talking about this, right? Yes, sir. The M one over M two, you know, when you multiply, what are you trying to multiply? The Do I one, sir. The I1 is multiplying everything here. Okay, sir. Do you understand? The I1 is multiplying everything there. And that is I1 times M1 times Y, because Y is the numerator. That is I1, M1, Y over M2. All over this particular one 
minus B plus M1. So you are having I1, M1, Y over M2 all over everything all over 1 minus B plus M1. When that now happens, what do you do? You then do your normal division um, sign and um, solve. Okay. okay sir. Yeah. Um, any other person raising hand? Um, none. Then um, let me check any chat. Okay. So oh. I asked you to use DS, I changed it so that, and I used it explicitly so I can understand, okay? So if that is the case, so that then implies that um, I go back, so now, we have been able to recall our ISLM model. We have been able to get that equation. Because what I'm doing is I don't want somebody to tell me, oh, how will I link it up? Because when the questions are coming, you won't be asking, how do I link it up? How do I bring it up? I expect you to link it up. That is why I spent time on this. Now, on the aggregate demand side, we now have the AD equation. We now consider demand side factors. So those factors that are in that equation, all right, of concern are my demand side factors. That is it. So what are my demand side factors? Tax. Remember that when I modify, if I should modify my consumption, I don't want to modify it because there is no space on the screen. If I modify it to include loss on tax and all of that, tax will be coming in, coming in till you have your AD equation. Tax becomes a demand side factor. Government expenditure becomes a demand side policy. Okay. Interest rate adjustment becomes a demand side policy. Money supply becomes a demand side policy. Those are the demand side policies. Then you look at the supply side factors. That is in the labor market. Maybe by next week, I will derive the aggregate supply equation so that you understand that part. So those supply side policies, supply side factors, becomes those wage rates adjustments, becomes technological adoption. Okay. All of those employment benefits, they are all supply side factors. So the minimum wage is a supply side policy, not a demand side policy. When government adjusted the minimum wage to move it to 30,000 naira. That is just increased wage rate. It's a supply side policy. So you must understand demand side and supply side. The demand side, like I've mentioned, tax, government expenditure, money supply, interest rate, they are all demand side. That is why all of those MSG, T, they are all in the AD equation. By the time I will derive the LM equation, you will see Sorry, by the time I will derive the um, aggregate supply equation, you will see that prices, wage rate, employment are those supply side policies. So when somebody tells you the demand side factors, supply side factors, you should be able to understand it now in this particular topic. Okay? Now, this, if you look at the AD model, the aggregate demand model and all of those derivations, sometimes they are unrealistic. Classicalist and the Keynesian, whichever way you take them, most of them are unrealistic. Okay? Look at the first one. The first one talks about the role of the supply side factors, such as the production function, labor market, wages and employment. Under the supply side, what those policy sides were advocating is anything that will improve production function. Production, why is a function of AKL, your K and L. Whatever that will improve labor market wages, whatever that will drive employment, they now ignored the demand side factors. So the supply side factors 
is emphasizing on the sales law. Remember, the sales law says supply will create its own demand. Okay. Again, the demand side factor is saying demand will create its own supply. That give people money. I hope you understand the historical development of. Um, okay, the historical development of Keynesian theory and the classical theory. I hope you understand that. I will still explain it again. Let me not just say much on that. But the supply side factors, all right, ignored the demand side factors and placed so much emphasis on production, improve wage, improve employment, improve production, improve wage, improve employment, and then ignore the demand side. Those that now came up to talk about the demand side factor, all right, have some assumptions that are also unrealistic. The first assumption is excess production capacity. What do they mean by that excess production capacity? Under the excess production capacity, they are saying, all right, they are saying that there will always be excess production, that there will always be food in the market. There will always be clothes in the store, in the showroom. There will always be goods to buy. There will always be a car. Just that people don't have money, empower them. But that is lie. That is not true. You cannot have excess production capacity. Many do not have. Why? Because of the cost of storage. What that theory is simply talking about, and what this assumption of the AD model is saying is that just have AD equations, have demand side policies, ignore the supply side, that there will always be output, Joe. There will always be goods in the market. There will always be this, but there are some factors, disasters that will hinder that. That you now empower people with so much money. And they will not be able to see what see goods anymore. Again, they believe that production function has constant returns. That is that is a lie. Production function does not have constant returns. That's production function does not have constant returns. Okay, most production faces increasing returns to scale. Many of the producers they enjoy increasing returns to scale whenever they try to produce. The next assumption is on constant wages. There is no constant wages anywhere. Wages are not constant. Wages are flexible. Again, the neutrality of government fiscal and monetary actions. Don't worry. When we match AD and AS together, you'll be able to see these particular assumptions there. Then I consider the derivation of the aggregate demand function. All right. I've done the derivation i've showed you the equation okay and then let's look at the graph you can see this is the graph you see that it is from your islm okay that you are able to generate or get your what aggregate demand equation oh okay it's from your islm that you are able to generate your aggregate demand what equation remember your is equation we got it your lm equation we got it when you now link the two together all right when you link the two together that will then give you when you link the two together that will then give you um um when you link the two together, that will now give you your aggregate demand equation. Now, all this movement is trying to tell you what will happen to your aggregate demand when there are changes in the demand side policy. Okay? So, I have a take home for you that I want you to ponder. Looking at the aggregate demand, looking at the ISLM, what happens when taxes increase? All right. What happens when government expenditure increases? What happens when government expenditure decreases? 
What happens when tax decreases? What happens when money supply increases? What happens when money supply decreases? What happens when interest rate increases? And what happens when interest rate decreases? You should be able to plot the graph of each of this. Of course, tax and government expenditure, if you trail it back to our beginning, they are embedded in the IS equation. So changes in government expenditure or tax will affect your IS. That will now cause your AD to change. Again, changes in money supply and interest rates will affect your LM. When it affects your LM, that will now cause your what? Your AD to change. So when money supply changes, IS will not change you. It is LM that will shift. It will now come and affect AD. So you see that we are trying to now link all of them together to now have aggregate demand and aggregate supply. I'm still dealing with aggregate demand. And when I'm through dealing with aggregate demand, I will now be able to deal with the aggregate supply. So, but in the aggregate demand, you have been able to know that yes. under the aggregate demand, you have been able to know that, um, that your... IS plus LM gives your aggregate demand. Your IS equation and LM equation gives aggregate demand. The IS and LM equation are affected by the demand side policies. The demand side policies are embedded in the IS or LM. The demand side policies from the IS is the government tax and the government expenditure. This demand side policies in the IS, in the LM, sorry, is the interest rate and the money supply. So you must begin to understand all of this so that when we get to AS, I will derive AS2, I will link the two together. We will now begin to look at policies and how they change. We will now consider effectiveness of one policy over the other. We will now begin to understand how Nigerian economy is. We can now relate it to Nigerian economy. And we will then begin to understand or appreciate different administrations focus. You now begin to understand Jonathan's regime, some of the policies, are they demand side policies or are they supply side policies? Buhari's administration, are they demand side policies or are they supply side policies? We now begin to ex understand or analyze the effectiveness of Empower program, Shopee program, Seven point agenda, operation feed the nation, ELGP target, and feed the children, children's this thing. You now begin to ask yourself, is this a demand side policy or is this a supply side policy? Is this a real sector policy or a demand side policy? So that when you graduate as an economist and you go out there, you should be able to clearly distinguish between a supply side policy and a demand side policy. You should be able to clearly distinguish what policy will affect output. What policy will empower people to get more money? You will begin to appreciate and understand why exchange rate will continue to depreciate in Nigeria. I'm not professoring doom. But you begin to understand why there is every likelihood that exchange rate will be depreciating because of so much pressure on the demand side policy you will begin to understand why commercial banks central bank has mandated commercial banks to redirect the loans they give out to the real sector to the supply side you begin to understand why central bank is telling commercial banks do not give out loans anymore reduce the loans you give to services sector to importation of petrol to all of those things Concentrate more on the retail sector, on the SMEs, on the wholesale sector. 
on the producers, you will begin to understand why the governor of CBN, when he came in this last convocation, he laid emphasis on investment in entrepreneurship. He laid emphasis on empowering the youths, on empowering students to become creative. You begin to understand why we built Unilag in collaboration with Bank of Industry, built that Bank of Industry and Innovation Hub at the back of, the, of our faculty. That is macroeconomics. So you begin to understand that. So that in your exam question, don't think you'll be seeing explain demand side policies and explain supply side policies. You will not see it though. We will deal with real issues. You will analyze the Shopee program, Empower, Operation Feed the Nation, all this entrepreneurship program, CBN's directive, commercial bank's policy drive towards investment in the real sector. You will begin to understand the demand side policy, the supply side policy, so you can talk as an economist. Um, thank you. I will, I don't know, is there any question? Does anybody have question? Okay, no question. I would, um, I would, um, okay. Um, Kabiru Sadiq, your question, please. Uh, good morning, sir. Yes, good morning. Okay, sir, because I want to go back to our AD equation. After oh. we derived our... Okay, let me see um, if I can share it here. I'm coming. Uh... I'm coming. Okay, the final AD equation, right? Yes, sir. With regards to when you were trying to um, take out the Y from the other this? side, that's yes, yes, that part. I okay. can explain my question from there. Okay. Okay, so sir, after you've derived our y equals to minus i1 m1 y over m2 all over 1 minus b plus m1, then you derive of y equals to 1 plus. So my question now is the 1 plus, um, how does it come in? How does it signify? Or oh, how did you begin the equation? You remember that when I was factorizing, uh, uh, Okay. okay, let me see if I can. Ah. Uh, it might be a bit. Um, let me see if I can trace it up. Let me see if I can trace it. Okay. Okay. You, 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 you will see, you will see that from um, this equation, you will see that, um, ah, I can't trace it, but by the time you take what you have on your right hand side to the left hand side, you will still have y plus i1 m1 y. Yes, you still have y plus i1 m1y over m2 open bracket 1 minus b plus m1 close the bracket. When you see it, you factor out y. Oh, okay. Just like just like okay. the way you factor out in your consumption normal is. Sure. When okay. you take it to that side, I say y into okay. this 1 minus c plus yeah. Okay. So you're not Okay, there. it's clear now. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I would um, stop my recording.